Hey, uh, we're fixing to pray and get started, uh, if y'all don't mind. Uh, also, I've been asked that when we go over to eat, the seniors, if, if y'all would be considerate, filling your plate, uh, make sure that there's enough left for the rest of them coming behind you so that, uh, <laughs> so that when, when they, you know, the, even the, the servers, when they get through, so they'll have enough to eat too. So they said you can come back for seconds, but just kind of, I'm, I don't know how to say this anyway, but anyway, just, just be considerate when you fill your plate. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love, and we do uh, thank you for everything you do for us, and we thank you for the things that's going on today, Father, and Lord, just ask that you bless. Lord, just uh, be with us in all the things that we do. Just be with Brother Mike as he uh, comes up and shares your word with us, Father. Lord, just uh, walk with Waylon. We thank you so much for him, Father. Lord, just... Uh, be with him as he leads our song service. Give us what we need today, Father, to uh, to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes. We're going to recognize somebody that's been serving our church for 28 years. Brother Brightman. Where's Miss Roxy? Miss Roxy, I'm going to present you with this gorgeous bouquet. <laughs> Oh, this is for you. I don't know how to put it on you. Here, Roxy, put this on you. We just want to thank Brother Waylon. I mean, he tried to leave us a couple times, but the Lord knew better and made him come back. So he knows. You got him back? No. How many rednecks does it take to put? <laughs> Balkan deal. Hey, Balkan. Mira needs to do this. This is a. This oh. There you go. Yeah, we should have assigned this to Mira. This she is could have. And for any visitors that we have today, today is Senior Citizen Day, and usually we get to go really elaborate, but the personnel committee would not give me any money. <laughs> so therefore, guess where y'all going? To the Balkanville Roadkill. Cafe, you kill it, we win. <laughs> <laughs> and one other thing too, by the way, they wouldn't let y'all go to Paris like you did last year, so you just got stuck with Balkanville this year, so that's be all right. But uh, also, we have something today. Every year on this Senior Adult Day, we give a special award to uh, someone. We have a, what's called the Ray Anding Award. And uh, just in honor of Brother Ray and people who have just faithfully served. And uh, Brother Whalen been here 28 years, folks. Been a long time uh, since they first came here. And we want to give that to Brother Whalen this year. And uh, <laughs> Brother Whalen, they're usually the ones producing that. They're usually the ones making it. So, uh, and Roxy, we're going to give you one we started two years ago, the Penny Davis Award. We want to give you that. I know they've always helped us produce those and give them out. We don't usually do staff, but I'll tell you, after 28 years, I think you can break tradition a little bit. Amen? And uh, give them that. So thank you so much for all they're doing. Matt, you need to do this. You know, Kathy's doing this Balkanville celebration. We're going to Balkanville. A couple of our members even look like they've been to the bar fight last night. <laughs> yeah, Brother Mike's coming in with black eyes, and Mike Turner's scarred up all over his head, bleeding. Uh, Larry, Larry Thompson beat up so bad he couldn't even come. Both eyes got stitches. It's just funny that all that's a, a part. But just a couple of announcements uh, this morning. Please stay for the senior banquet. Kathy would have plenty of food. Uh, the baby dedication on May the 29th. If you have any babies, please let the office know. Uh, we, want, we will have visitation tomorrow night at 530. We'll go out. This is our week to go out. So come be with us. Go out and share. Reach people. Uh, show the visitors we've seen how much we appreciate it. 
We have a wonderful time doing it. Tonight, since we got all these activities, we're going to call services. We're not going to have services tonight because uh, the time everybody leaves here to be 2, 2.30. Yeah, I won't have time to get my nap in. <laughs> so uh, we're going to cancel services tonight. So, Brother Wayne. All right. Are you going to mention something about the pictures? Yes, yes. Memorial Day pictures we need for next week. Just for clarification, it's those who gave their life in service. Veterans Day is for those that have served, but Memorial Day is for those who uh, did sacrifice ultimately their life. So if you'll be sh get that picture to me or Stacy and give us a little blurb about them. Tell us who they are, how you're kin, the, the service that they did, and uh, things like that. So, all right? Let's stand together. Do you all agree we have a great God? Yes. Amen. Let's sing together. The splendor of the King, both in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness strives to hide, and trembles at his voice. Watch. 
joy shall fill my heart, then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God. We're going to take a little opportunity to sing a couple of things that I hope that you will like, and you are welcome to sing along with us. Let's hit it, Daniel. I'm going to let the glory roll when the roll is called in glory. I'm going to get beside of myself when I get beside the King that day. I'm going to have the time of my life when the time of my life is over. I'm going to get carried away when I get carried away. Well, I don't know why I become a little shy when I get around a whole lot of people. And I can't figure out why I never can shout about the love that floods my soul. I must confess I can't express the feelings deep inside me. The things I know but cannot show one day will overflow. I'm going to let the glory roll when the roll is called in glory. I'm going to get beside of myself when I get beside the King that day. I'm going to have the time of my life when the time of my life is over. I'm going to get carried away when I get carried away. Well, I pass the clouds and shout so loud it may sound like thunder. My cheerful eyes may fill the skies until it looks like rain. And as I leave this world, past the gates of pearl, and stand before the Savior, I'll let my soul and let the glory roll, and from the roll he calls my name. I'm gonna let the glory roll when the roll is called in glory. I'm gonna get beside of myself when I get beside the King that day. I'm gonna have the time of my life when the time of my life is over. I'm gonna get carried away when I get carried away. Y'all sing it with us. I'm gonna let the glory roll when the roll is called in glory. I'm gonna get beside of myself when I get beside the King that day. I'm gonna have the time of my life when the time of my life is over. I'm gonna get carried away when I get carried away. I'm gonna get carried away, carried away. When I get carried away. Y'all thought y'all was going to get a blessing. That's in my... I don't know. Are you ready? No. Are you sure? Your mic off? Um, testing is on. 
There's a city of light where there cometh no night, for the sun never sets in the sky. In the Bible we're told that the streets are pure gold and a cool I'm bound for that city, God's holy white city. Oh, yes, I am. I'll never turn back to this world anymore. No matter how rough may be the way, no matter how oft I stop to pray, I'm bound for that city. On that evergreen shore Little children will play And our hearts will be gay As we stroll through the city of gold No more dying up there No more birds Nobody will be feeble and old. I'm bound for that city, God's holy white city. Oh, yes, I am. I'll never turn back to this world anymore. No matter how rough may be the way. No matter how oft I stop to pray, I'm bound for that city on that evergreen shore. Y'all sing it. I know you know it. I'm bound for that city, God's holy white city. Oh, yes, I am. I'll never turn back to this world anymore. No matter how rough may be the way, no matter how oft I stop to pray, I'm bound for that city on that evergreen Fallen soul, he looked 
reach beyond my fault and saw my need. I shall forever lift my eyes to Calvary, to for me how marvelous the grace that caught my fallen soul he looked beyond my fault and saw my need how marvelous Caught my falling soul, he looked beyond my fault, he looked beyond my fault, he looked beyond my fault, and so Yes, I do. Yes, we. Um, hmm. I have to pay her, but yes, we. Children go out for children's church this morning. And I'll say to all of you that uh, thankful to all of our, our folks who came up this week. Of course, we've had a lot of ladies working in the back this week and getting prepared for our big event, which uh, our Senior Adult Day, uh, which if you are 60 or above, we want you to stay and be a part of that with us today, if you would. And some of you, you know, maybe he or she is 60 and the other one's not, but that's all right. As long as one of you is at least 60 you got to put an age on there to, to have, everybody's going to ask the question, well, who's supposed to go over there? So we've typically gone with 60 uh, as our age, but it's, we're going to have a good time over there. But there's been a lot of folks preparing over there this week, and then also a lot working in here. If you haven't noticed, there's a, uh, patches of carpet gone, and uh, the upper level of the loft is gone, and they're preparing, and they're going to start painting in here tomorrow. So, uh, and then finish working on this, uh, they'll be getting started with the flooring, the new carpet. Uh, so the next few Sundays, uh, I'm not sure about next week, but coming up in the next few Sundays, you're going to show up some Sundays and maybe your section of pews are gone. They've been taken out to work on it and haven't got them put back in yet. And some of you are going to panic, I know, when you see that. Because my pew, I, I sit right there every Sunday, and I say to you, just go ahead and sit there, sit on the floor. We don't care. Bring a, bring a, a, a lawn chair with you if you want to and sit on that spot. But uh, uh, there are going to be a few changes. You, you may have to find a new place to sit over the next few weeks, but uh, it'll be temporary. You'll see one section gone maybe one week, and the next week it may be another section gone as they put new flooring in and new carpet, and things like that, and uh, so just be patient, and it's going to be worth it all when you see it finished, see the finished project, the product of that, it's going to be beautiful, but thanks to all of you who came in, so many of you guys are working in here this week, thank you for that, and uh, you know, they didn't do anything, they finished up Wednesday, you know, and then they used some excuse like some of the wood wasn't ready so they could take Thursday and Friday off. The fact is, they was worn out. They was worn slap out, and I understand that. Uh, they were they were kind of tired, 
And uh, everybody's asked me about my eye this morning and what happened to my eye. There's been all kind of accusations. Randy, be quiet over there. All right. But, uh, no, I started to put a patch on it and come like Rooster Cogburn. I watch John Wayne movies all weekend. So I uh, started to put a patch on it and come like watch Rooster Cogburn. I, it really happened, I'll tell you all. Uh, I've been telling people that I went to the woods with Gary Stuckey to do something and came out with a bad eye. So uh, you take it like you want to there. But the uh, fact was I got up to put my skinny jeans on this morning. My skinny jeans that have holes in them, Miss Dawn had patched all the holes in them. She had washed them, and I've been leaving them unwashed for the last three or four weeks just so they would fit in. I would fit in right, you know. And she done patched all the holes, and me and Miss Dawn had a little come-to-Jesus meeting. Uh-oh. I'm, I'm jumpy now, so. But anyway, we had a little come-to-Jesus meeting, and she won. And so I'm not going to fuss about skinny jeans no more. And so, anyway, but uh, I was glad to see Brother Whalen and Brother Hugh both had jackets on this morning, and I came without one today. I guess my sermon last week was more effective for them than it was for me. I went the other direction, but uh, anyway, uh, we had a good time this week, and uh, uh, all of us are, several of us are beat up. Uh, Larry's bruised up, and I'm bruised up, and Brother Mike Turner's bruised up, and uh, Brother Ray fell and broke his arm this week, and just had all kind of things happen to us this week. So that's why Matt said we're not going to come tonight because I don't know if we got enough people to get here and open the doors up. I just got keys, you know. But uh, we're going to have a busy day today. First Peter chapter 2, as we look at how God sees us. Now, I, I won't say like I said last week, God doesn't just see us what's on the, He doesn't see what's on the outside as much as God, we know the Bible says God looks at what's in your heart. And what is God looking for in the heart of His people? Well, this, this is a very descriptive, if you will, a very, 1 Peter chapter 2 is very descriptive of what God sees as the church, what God sees in His people. And uh, stand with me, if you would, if you feel like it, and stand and honor the reading of God's holy word. I want to read verses 1 through 12 of chapter 2 of 1 Peter. It says, Therefore, laying aside all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all evil speaking, as newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious... Coming to Him, now listen, here's where I'm going to begin to focus on verse 4. Coming to Him as to living, a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer, unto, offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained uh, in, the, in the Scriptures. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected will become that chief cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you, and here's who we are. Here's more of a description of who we are. You're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. 
Amen. That's who we are. These verses describe who we are as God's people, the church. And uh, let's, we're going to take that apart today and talk a little bit about it. Let's pray. Father, as we read these scriptures, we're reminded today of your love and your mercy. We're reminded today that you love us. God, you have a plan for us. You've redeemed us. You've renewed us, Lord. And God, you've sent us out into the world to make a difference in that world. Help us, Lord, to not be ashamed of who you are. But as the scripture here says, to show forth your praises in a lost and dying and dark world. And so, God, today we ask you to speak to us through these texts, through these scriptures this morning. May your truth uh, challenge us, Father, to represent you well in this world. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right. Be seated if you would. Uh, if you ever thought about how God looks at us, I, I sometimes think about how God looks at us and what God, and really by how God looks at us, it really says something about what God expects from us. I believe that God sees us. The Bible defines four ways specifically that God sees us. The first one is as a brotherhood. I, I list those four there as a brotherhood. First Corinthians 1 9 talks about that brotherhood, and, and really it's really about us being the family of God, how God really looks to us to be uh, His representatives, brothers and sisters in Christ. And, uh, and really it shows how that God expects us to, I like to say, lock arms together and to represent Him well in this world. I believe that as believers, we ought to be able to represent God well in this world. He says there in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, for we are fellow, God's fellow workers and you are God's field and God's building. And so that's just some definition and description of that. I'm sorry, chapter 1, that was chapter 3. I read the, verse, the wrong chapter, but it did give us description. I am going to talk about being a part of God's building here in just a moment. And uh, how important that is for us to understand. But chapter 1, verse 9 says, God is faithful to, by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. How important it is that we understand that God calls us to be part of a family. He calls us to be part of a, of a family unit, if you will. To uphold each other, to care about each other, and to support the work, the general work of the family of God. And what is that work? It is to give a, the world a better idea of what it means to join the family, to become the sons and daughters of God. The Bible says to those that receive Him, He gives them the right to be called the children of God. First, uh, that's in John 1, 12. And so it's important that we understand that, that as brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a responsibility to represent the Father. And, uh, and God really is that patriarchal family leader that we desire God to be, that God wants us to be His children that represent Him in our world. A second thing it said quickly, I want to touch on these four, a building. Not only are we a brotherhood, but we're called to be a, a building. I, I read that in 1 Corinthians 3 a while ago, but... Also in, in Ephesians and also Matthew 16, 18, where he talks about that God said, And I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, God's not talking about a specific building, not a physical building, but he's talking about the body of Christ being a structure. Uh, we were an edifice, the Bible says. Uh, and so it's important that we understand that the church would be something that would be strong. It would be something that would be a place where people could come to and find the forgiveness of God, the love of God. They could worship God. Hopefully the, that we as believers, as the church, can help people to see God and know God and understand God and to experience God. A third thing was as a body. He referred to the, to the church as much like a body. Uh, John 1, 12, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 12 says that he has a, it defines the plan that God has for us as the body of believers. 
is so important that we understand that a body is a living organism. So in other words, the church is never intended to be some some uh, unfeeling, insensitive group of people, but instead it is a body that works together. It's just like my fingers make my hand work better, and my feet make my legs work better, and my toes make my feet work better. Have you ever tried to run without a big toe? It's basically impossible. It's basically impossible. Try to throw a baseball without a thumb. It's basically impossible for us to do that. And because all the body parts work together. And so that's what a beautiful illustration that is of God's church, the body, a living organism that works together. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about that. And then lastly, it's referred to as a bride, uh, the bride of Christ. Ephesians 5.25 talks about how that the husband's the head of the wife and the wife uh, and, and then the, just as Christ is the head of the church, it says. Uh, he's referred to in, in a number of places, but specifically, Revelation 19 talks about the last days when that, that the bride, we, are to be preparing ourselves by how we live this life. And one day there will be a marriage celebration in heaven. Did you know that? Right now we're, referred, we're like that bride that's in waiting. We're waiting for the Lord to come back and get us. The church is the bride of Christ, the love of His life. Do you understand that? Do you understand that as a believer, you're the love of Christ's life? He loves you. He desires. He longs for that day. I I believe the Lord longs for the day to bring the church home, to take the church home, His bride. He's waiting right now for those last ones that are supposed to join He knows who they are. I don't know who they are, but He knows the future, and I don't know the future. And so we look at that today, and there are four specific ways, uh, pictures in the Bible that God shows of the church. Now, He also describes us here in 1 Peter chapter 2, as we were looking at, as I read from earlier. And there's some unique things there that stand out in 1 Peter chapter 2. To me, that stand out is the desire of God. I see, first of all, in verse 2, His desire for us to move on and to grow up and to mature, not to remain as baby believers, if you will, but to really be firm. And that what that literally means is that you can live through your faith. Faith helps you handle those tough issues in life. You don't quit in those tough times of life. And so we see God's Word talks about that. And verse 3 talks about having tasted of the graciousness of God's, God's grace that He offers us. Have you tasted of God? Is there a, is there a, 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 do you sense God in your life? And you know that you have experienced God. How important that is. And then it refers to Him as being that that living stone, because He is the foundational stone. He is the cornerstone, uh, Corinthians says. And you know what that means is they put that cornerstone, when they finish building that building, the last thing they put up is that cornerstone, I'm told. And if it doesn't fit in the place they have reserved for it, then the building was built improperly and must be torn down and rebuilt because it's not built according to the dimensions of the cornerstone. And He is what everything else is measured by. And then He says, we are living stones. So the picture is that the Lord Jesus Christ is that giant stone that everything else is measured by. And then you and I are the little stones that are placed in the walls that build up that church. Definitely not a, not a physical building, but a spiritual building that God is building. And it's representative of the place where God dwells. Just as He did in the Old Testament, God dwelt in a building. He met them in a building. Here in the New Testament, He meets us and meets people in a building too, but that building is you and I. It's not a physical building like this. And, and this building goes and meets people where they are, at work, at school, in different places. And yet God says, I'm sending you out with my presence. I'm sending you out that others may see you and hear you. 
And so here's what he says I want them to see, beginning in verse 9. He lists seven things here that he wants them to see and hear from us. First of all, he wants us to understand this is how God sees us. In verse 9, the first one he mentions is a chosen generation. He says, you are a chosen generation. Now, that doesn't mean, I don't believe it means, the Bible doesn't say that it means that down before time, God just went down and for no reason said to people, you can be saved, no, you're going to hell. You can be saved, no, you're going to hell. For no reason at all. I don't love some of you and I'm going to send some of you to hell. That's taught some places today. But I believe in, I believe my God loves everybody. I believe that I can go out and visit with people and I can say to them, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, and I'm not lying to some of those people. You see, if I believe God just loves some of the people, I couldn't make that statement because I don't know if God loves them or not. Isn't that sad? Wouldn't it be sad if God didn't love your children and just let your children go to hell? That's not the God that I recognize from the Bible. I recognize a God who says that I love you. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And God is love. And I believe that God loves and God desires all men to come to salvation, the Bible says. But what this means is that God, just as He chose the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, to be His first people, that the people He would come to them and say, I'm partnering with you to carry the gospel to the world. I'm partnering with you, and I'm coming to you first and giving you this opportunity to partner with me and do my work. And the Jewish people, in some ways, thought they did. They took on all the religious ceremony that went along with that. But when it came down to really knowing God and having a relationship with God, they didn't. And they chose not to. In fact, over in Matthew chapter 13 and verse Verse 15, he talked about them being a people, and this is a quote out of Isaiah, that they, would be, that they had become hard of hearing, dull of hearing, and, and, and they, they couldn't understand the things of God, or they had rejected the things of God. This new covenant relationship that built upon grace, they rejected that view of God. And then God, the Bible tells us that God began to move on to the Gentile people. God began to move on and build a new chosen people, a new group of people that He would work with that would carry the gospel to the world, who would be His witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. Man, the Jewish people would never want to go to Samaria. They didn't like the Samarians. But God was looking for a people that would love everybody, that would carry the gospel to everybody. And the Gentiles, he included the Gentiles then in this chosen generation. The people who would get the opportunity to partner with God to carry the gospel message of God's love and God's grace to the world. Now, what does that say to you? It says to you that you are special to God because God decided to include you in His plan. A chosen people. In other words, that word chosen means you're a special people that get to be a part of God's Word. Who is that people? Who is that church? I don't know all of them. I don't know everyone who's going to be a a part of that, but I believe God's made that offer to the world. He's made that offer to the world and said that I love you. Would you like to be a part of this new chosen family? And that's who we are. And that's who everyone is. You know, it's just, it didn't mean, I I, I said this earlier, just when the Jews, when God chose to work with the Jewish people first, that didn't mean that every Jewish person was going to heaven. Now, some people want to teach that. If you're Jewish, you're going to heaven. You don't have any, you don't have any, you're going to heaven. No. No, there's a lot of Jewish people who wanted nothing to do with God. And that not every Jewish person, just because the Jews were the chosen people of God, it didn't mean every Jew was going to heaven. And when you get to be a chosen part of God's church, a bride chosen for God, I don't understand everything about salvation. And you don't either. You may think you do, but you don't. But I know this. First of all, God loved you before you were loving God. Amen? The Bible tells us that. He loved you first. And if you're willing to see the love of God, and if you're willing to turn from your sin and trust Him as your Lord and Savior... He will save you. 
No matter who you are here today, no matter what you've done, God's offering you a chance to be a part of His chosen bride, the family of God. He's inviting you to be a part of that today. And I believe with all of my heart, just like every Jewish person is not going to go to heaven, every Gentile person is not going to go to heaven either. I don't know who he is and who isn't. I believe God knows. I believe God knows what that old book of life is going to look like one day. Amen? I don't know all the names in that book of life, but God probably does at this point, don't you think? Because God knows all things. And so we look at that today and say, here's a God that loves me. Here's a God that has chosen to reveal himself to me. And what a special people I get to be a part of. The chosen people of God. That's who you are. Chosen to be loved by God. A second thing I want you to see is a people who are devoted to Christ. A royal priesthood, he says. A royal priesthood. What does the priesthood do? What does the priesthood do? Well, if you look at what a priest does, basically his job is to help people worship God, know God, experience God's forgiveness, So basically, a priest stands between lost man and a holy God and helps, hopefully, to bring those two together. Now, I know it kind of ties into that first part up there, but we do have a part as the priesthood of God. When you become part of God's family, did you know that you joined the priesthood? You become part of a special people that's going to help lost man Find the love of God. We have a part in that. It's called the preaching of the gospel. The Bible says it's foolishness to the world. But God takes the preaching of the gospel and he uses that in some way to prick the heart and open up the heart and convict the heart of those who need to be saved. Oh, my friend. Uh, My friend, when God opens your heart, When God awakens you to the Spirit of God, when the Spirit of God stirs you, it's a wonderful thing. And if you've never had that opportunity to sit down with somebody and introduce them to God, I want you to know God wants you and I to do that. That's not just my job. That's our job, to introduce people to God. What a privilege that is, to introduce people to God. To God. Do you realize how special you are to God? He wants you and I to be His intermediaries. He wants you and I to be His hands and His feet and His voice and His heart and to go out there to the world. God's given us a big responsibility. Do you understand that's who you are? Oh, don't, don't, don't not fulfill that part of your calling. Don't get the idea like some people that that's what we pay the preacher for. You know what you're doing? If you get that attitude, you're missing out on a lot of the blessings God's got for you. And there's people that you'll meet and you'll get to know that I'll never meet and I'll never get to know. And God wants you to introduce them to God. Number three, he says we'd be a holy nation, which means distinctive in character. Distinctive in character, a holy nation, not not a nation that says crazy things, not a nation that says, well, I know what the Bible says, but we don't care what the Bible says. We want to be a secular nation, not a nation that says, well, a mama can. I heard a lady do an interview this week who said, who was talking about all the big, big abortion debate today and all that's going on in our world. Here's what he said. This lady said, They asked her, he said, whose responsibility is that little life inside of her? She said, the mama's. Well, what about the life? If it's a life, doesn't that life have the right to live? Uh, Doesn't that life have any? Nope, it's totally up to the mama. She said, it's up to the mama. What if that child is six months old and can live outside the womb? Nope, totally up to the mama. So what if it's eight months old? Nope, totally up to the mama. What if it's nine months old, just about to be born, and and is healthy, and everything great about this baby? Nope, totally up to the mama. So let me ask you one more question. What if this baby has been born, and is now a three-month-old baby? Whose responsibility is it? Does that mother still have a say? She said, it's totally up to the mother whether that baby should live or die. What an idiot. 
I mean, that's a brain-dead person up walking around. A person with no heart. A person who's totally evil in the sight of God. But do you know in many in our nation, do you know that New York City passed a law saying that a baby, and they even the governor was promoting it in Virginia, that said a baby could be born and set to the side and then asked the parents, do you want this baby to live or die? That is evil. That is barbarian. We live in that world today. We live in that world when God says we're to be the people of God ought to definitely be a holy nation. Now, I, I can halfway understand when a lost person acts like that, can't you? They don't know God. You can't, you can't curse a blind person for not being able to see. And they have no knowledge of God. And they simply live on their self-reason. And they have no, they've not been transformed by the power of God and by the Word of God. Which, by the way, we are born again by the incorruptible Word of God. That brings about a conviction in our lives. As 1 Peter chapter 1 says, the first few verses there. And God is saying to us, my friend, that, that I want this nation, this church, this body of believers that I'm building. He said, we're going to be a holy people. Now, I can go to some corners of even the, of the church today and start talk, talking about being a holy people. And you know what they'll say? Well, that's a little self-righteous, don't you think? That's a little bit uh, arrogant. Don't you think? That sounds like legalism to me, they'll say. God just says be holy. Holy just means different from the world. Holy means that we have dedicated ourselves, our hearts and our minds to the ways of God. And if God says it, I ought to believe it. And if I believe it, I ought to live it. That's what it means. It means a people who are dif distinctive in their very character. Not a nation that endorses things that God calls an abomination. And definitely not churches that endorse something that is an abomination. There are churches today endorsing the uh, homosexual lifestyle. There are churches today endorsing abortion on demand. Up to the time of birth. Churches doing that. They've missed out on being. And, and let me just say, just because you got church in your name, and just because you got a building, you may not be part of God's church. Hello? Should I say that? I will. I'm old enough to say that. You, you may not be a part of God's church. You may be a part of a, a church of some kind. But I doubt very seriously if you're part of God's church. Because when you get born again, you'll change your thinking to be more of a holy nation of people. A people who follow the ways of God. A people who say, my way is God's way. God's way is my way. So he says here, I want you to be a, a distinctive, separate nation. A th fourth thing I want you to see, he called them a, well, the King James says a peculiar people. I like that because Baptist is the most peculiar people I've ever met. Now, I read New King James this morning. It says uh, his own special people. <laughs> Bless your heart, you're special. Amen? Well, aren't you special this morning? You know, and, and so we think about that, and, and basically what it means is a people, it, it's somewhat like being a holy nation. It's a people that are set apart, that are different from the, the world, but yet a, a people that, are, that stand out on those issues where they need to stand. There is a clear distinction between them and the thinking of the world. They think with love. They think with grace. They think about the mission and the calling of God to touch the world. Could I ask you, do you think about what goes on in the kingdom of God in, in, in this, let's, even this church? Do you even think about what goes on up here from Sunday to Sunday? Does it ever cross your mind? 
Or do you go in and throw your Bible down somewhere and the next Sunday morning you're saying, Honey, where did I put my Bible last week? I can't find it. That tells me you hadn't found it all week. Amen. And, and do you think about what God, what is important to God? Or do you only think about your life? I'm here to tell you, I don't care what you do. If you're a carpenter, you need to think about it every day. How would God have you do your job as a carpenter? What kind of attitude will you have there? How will you do what you do for the glory of God that week? And what is my mission? What is my calling? When you go to work tomorrow morning or you go to school, you ought to think about how does God want to use me here? Why? Because you're a particular person. You're not like everybody else out there. You're a follower of Christ. And I believe with all of my heart, the Bible teaches us that I'm a follower of Christ before I'm anything else. Hello? Are you with me on that? You're a follower of Christ before you are that carpenter. You're a follower of Christ before, hear me now, before you're a husband. You're a follower of Christ before you're a football player or a baseball player. Whatever you do, whoever you are, if you're really part of the church, God says, you are to be dedicated to a cause. And that's what this one is telling us. A people who are dedicated to the cause. The Bible refers to that cause as the way sometimes. And Jesus is the one who has said he, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Sometimes it talks about going the way. And that's what we are dedicated to, God's way. Number five. It says that we would also, down in verse 10 here, well, uh, the last part of verse 9 too, it talks about a, a people who proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness. Who show forth His praises, the Bible says. Some translations say, says, we're unashamed to declare our marvelous God. Unashamed. I thought about that song, Brother Whalen. I'm going to put lump these last three together, and then I want us to sing that song. Miss Mira, can you play 337? You can, you can come on up now and get yourself positioned up there. I, I wouldn't have put that on you at the last minute, but I just thought of it while I was sitting there this morning. And I, I thought about and there's probably some, several other songs we could have used, but we are unashamed of our marvelous God. Unashamed in declaring our Creator. Undeclared, undesired, undeterred, unashamed. And number three, delivered from the curse. We ought to celebrate that we're not children of darkness, but we're children of the light. That's who we are. We're children of the light. Do you celebrate the fact that you're not walking in darkness anymore? And the last one, we are disciplined for heaven. He goes on and says there in that last verse, we're not people who are now, the, we are the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now we have. And we're not, we're not as sojourners and pilgrims, we weren't part of the family of God. But he says, I want you to live with an honorable conduct among those Gentiles. In other words, I want you to live like you're headed to heaven. Don't live like the devil and tell everybody you're going to heaven. Amen? Don't live like that. Man, you live different from the world. Now, I know some are going to say, well, I, I don't know about that. Now, that seems legalistic to me. But I'm here to tell you something. We ought to be different from the world. Amen? If you don't know this song, 337, I forget the title. What was it? I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. Would you stand and sing that song with us right now? Just sing it with us and celebrate it. And then afterwards, we're going to 
just let that song play softly, Miss Mira, for an invitation, if we could. And just let the music play after we sing a couple of verses, maybe the first and the last, Brother Whalen. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto Do you know that this morning as the music plays softly? If you're here this morning and you're not certain about your life, you're not certain about heaven, if you died today, would you go to heaven? Can you say without a doubt, 100%, I know that I've done what God's asked me to do and I know that God's going to do what He's supposed to do. And that's to keep me. To keep me. You believe that? Can you say that this morning? That I know, I am persuaded that He is able to keep all that I've committed to Him. Oh, my friend, if you're here this morning and you've never been saved, I'm going to ask you to come right now. If you say, I've never been saved, or I'm not certain if I'm saved, but I need to talk to somebody, Pastor, while they play this song softly, would you come? Right now, would you come? Come and say, Pastor, I want Jesus. Or maybe you want to join this church and put your membership here. Maybe you want to come to the altar and pray. hope that you know that. My prayer is that you know that. And I want you to understand who you are today to God. This message this morning was just about knowing how God sees you. And I think by knowing how God sees us, it also helps us to know what God expects of us. He expects our depth of commitment to Him. Amen. And so I pray that you are committed to Him, whether you're in school or whether you're going to work tomorrow, whatever it may be. Uh, show the world who you belong to. That's what God tells us to do. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning in the house of the Lord. It's good to look out and see this crowd and to know that uh, we're here with purpose this morning and to worship the Lord, to know the Lord, and uh, to celebrate the Lord this morning. What color are we using up here for our prayer? Huh? Green? Okay. Make sure I get that. I want to have someone close us in prayer. But also it's going to be our, our food. We want to thank the Lord for the food next door. Brother Chuck, would you close us in prayer? And would you bless our food and fellowship over there? Sir. Thank you. Father God, we're coming to you, Lord, today. Just want to say thank you. Thank you for who you are. And thank you for always being with us. Thank you for guidance, direction. 
and the right way to go. Father, we thank you for the message which we heard this morning. May our hearts have been opened that we receive this message. And as we leave here, we draw closer to you and become a better Christian. Now, Father, as we go across the, across the way to partake of the food which has been provided for us, you provided the food, but you put the hands behind it to cook and serve. And thank you for all those who are doing that. And God, I ask your blessings upon the food that it might nourish and strengthen our bodies and our bodies may be used in your service. And God, forgive us where we have failed you and come short of your glory. In a precious, holy, sweet name of your Son, Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen.